I'd like to call the uh, Air Knights Commission meeting to order and uh, open it for business. Uh, first on the agenda is approval of the minutes for Air Knights Commission meeting of October 6th, which is in our uh, folder. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of that meeting? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, let's call roll for the, uh, the meeting today. Go ahead, please. First Congressional District Commissioner Kevin Potter. Second Congressional District Commissioner David Conway. Here. Third Congressional District Commissioner Charles Ortega. Here. Fourth Congressional District Commissioner Lindy Ritz. Here. Fifth Congressional District Commissioner Blake Graining. Here. At-Large Commissioner Chairman Jim Putnam. Here. At-Large Commissioner Jerry Hunter. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Now we're eligible. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now we'll talk about the approval of the minutes for October 6th meeting. Any additions or corrections? All right. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. And Move to approve. We need okay. a second. Okay. Call roll, please. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Chairman Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Next up is item four, election of officers for the calendar year of 2022. Mr. Chairman, if I may. You may, sir. I'd like to move that we appoint Mr. Commissioner Hunter as chairman, Commissioner Ritz as vice chairman, and Commissioner Ortega as secretary. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. I'll second that. Okay, call the roll, please. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Commission Chairman Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Great. Out of a job next month. Super. <laughs> <laughs> That's going well. All right. Next up is the director report, Mr. Artis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hear it pays extremely well. Lots of lots of responsibilities. Commissioner Hunter, uh, looking forward to those responsibilities, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll keep, uh, we'll make sure to keep everybody in line and uh, look forward to uh, having the next slate of officers serve us for uh, calendar year 2022. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, director's report, it has been a busy couple of months here. Um, we were at October 8th visiting the Choctaw Nation's uh, program, the drone program that they have down there in southeast Oklahoma, also known as the Daisy Ranch. Uh, they were one of the uh, nine entities selected for uh, the integration pilot program, uh, which was started under the uh, Trump administration. That's now called the Beyond program. It's been transitioned to the Beyond program. It really is a, a highlight of the state that, that Oklahoma uh, has one of those uh, test site programs. They're doing a lot of really neat research and in drone testing in terms of how do we integrate this this UAS and this AAM, Advanced Air Mobility, what used to be called Urban Air Mobility, how do we integrate that into our nation's airspace safely, efficiently, and effectively so that that economic ecosystem of aviation aerospace uh, can succeed moving forward. Uh, followed that on by the National Business Aviation Association Conference where uh, Sandra Shelton and I attended. Uh, had a, a great Oklahoma delegation at NBAA this year. We uh, filled out the new West Hall of the Convention Center there in, in Las Vegas, Nevada, at October 12th through the 14th. Uh, we had several companies <coughs> that were there that partnered with us, uh, including CTS Turbines, Kratos, Dura Coatings, and uh, Sorol USA. We also had Ardmore, Enid, Durant, the Oklahoma City Chamber, the Broken Arrow Chamber uh, and Senator Racino that uh, attended this uh, particular conference with us. It was a good conference, uh, a lot better attended than what I think NBA's original expectations were. They uh, implemented a, a vaccine requirement and that boosted their, uh, their attendance. Um, I think it was down from a traditional year as most of our conferences have been in, in 2021, uh, but it was good to get back and get back in the action with NBA and made a lot of a lot of good connections, had about a dozen and a half meetings with various companies. Uh, and as we've seen throughout our 2021 conference cycle as we've gotten back from the, the post-COVID world, uh, a lot of people excited about coming to Oklahoma, wanting to hear about what Oklahoma has to offer, maybe getting out of their home state that was a little more restrictive or locked down, uh, or may not be giving them the, the customer service that they need uh, for their business. So good opportunities there and, and had some good receptions uh, and some good meetings. 
followed that up by a uh, <coughs> program visit to the uh, Osage Nations uh, UAS facility. As you can see there, this is an old uh, North, this is the old North Tulsa Airport. Uh, they have uh, purchased this, uh, developed a casino nearby. It's, it's become one of the, the big headquarters regions for the Osage Nation, and they are actively recruiting uh, UAS companies to come to the state uh, to utilize this facility, and they've received a EDA grant to refurbish some of the old uh, traditional aviation facilities, some of the old hangar facilities, into some drone uh, manufacturing facilities, and uh, I believe, hopefully, We'll be making some announcements in uh, the upcoming year about uh, a company or two that is going to relocate to some of those facilities that are going to be renovated. So pretty exciting stuff happening with, with UAS and the drone industry for Oklahoma. I had the opportunity to uh, present and speak to the Oklahoma Transportation Research Day at the uh, National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum on uh, October 19th. Uh, they wanted me to talk about how drones can launch us into the next decade. Uh, obviously, we haven't seen this much energy and excitement about aviation aerospace since probably the space race, the Cold War. Uh, and that's one of the things that we always talk about when it comes to, to aerospace uh, workforce development is how do we get young people excited about aviation aerospace careers? Obviously, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had ingrained free marketing with the Cold War and the space race. People wanted to go join this career field, to support our country, to, to do cool things like go into space and, and get us to the moon by the end of the 60s. Uh, and that, that worked for a long time, but once the space race ended, once the Cold War ended, once the space program kind of uh, went, went off the rails and we were no longer doing <coughs> United States-based uh, space transportation, really we, we lost that free marketing throughout the 90s and the early 2000s. And I think this, UAS, AAM, UAM, uh, and drones, I hope will be that next big thing. We've seen it in our aviation aerospace education program, what drones can do in the hands of a kid in terms of getting them excited about aviation aerospace careers. And they may not go on to become a drone pilot, but the fact that they get that spark from using a drone, seeing a drone, touching a drone, operating a drone, then may lead them into, oh, well, I want to become a pilot, or I want to become an engineer, or I want to become a mechanic. And so uh, that's kind of how I presented this particular presentation was we really want to use drones to help create that spark with our young people and moving them into their career field, wh wherever it's going to be. I don't care what they do when they get to aviation aerospace. I just want them to join aviation aerospace, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to use the drone to be able to do that. October 28th, uh, we had the Oklahoma Aerospace Forum. Uh, great opportunity. This is something that's been going on for the last three or four years. Uh, Interest Bank has been a, a big sponsor and supporter of the Aerospace Forum. Uh, there in the picture you have uh, former General Hawk Carlisle, who's now the head of the uh, National Defense Industry Association, uh, gave the, the keynote presentation. Uh, I actually spoke uh, on one of the panels there uh, alongside uh, the uh, Phil, or not Phil Busey, but Brian Busey with uh, DRG, uh, Ryan Gertson with AAR, uh, Jeff Camp with the ACES program, and we were moderated by Lieutenant Governor Matt Pinnell. And it was a, a great opportunity to talk about how do we elevate aerospace in our state. And there's definitely different things that we can take advantage of, uh, making sure that our DOD presence and making sure that we're able to take advantage of the contracts that Tinker is letting into the new programs that are coming on board at Tinker Air Force Base. Uh, we also talked about how do we get kids interested in this career field? How do we get more curriculum into high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, and get our kids excited about aviation aerospace careers? And that's one of the things that we ended up focusing on the most was <clears throat> how do we transition that knowledge and that excitement that the current workers have and that the aging workforce in aviation aerospace has? How do we transition that to our young folks? And, and you'll see here... Uh, later in the uh, commission agenda, some of the great things that we have and some of the announcements that we uh, uh, are going to be making to help move that forward and help get our kids and our young people excited about aviation aerospace careers. Uh, Commissioner Rainey and I and Sandra uh, went down to the uh, McAllister Army Ammunition Plant and took a tour of that facility. Uh, it's, it's one of those crown jewel uh, DOD military installations that most people don't know about. They know about Tinker Air Force Base, they hear about Altus Air Force Base, they hear about Vance Air Force Base, they know about Air National Guard, they even know about Fort Sill, but they don't know what resides in McAllister in the Army Ammunition Plant. And I'll uh, 
let Commissioner Rainey or Sandra uh, elaborate, but I was, I was pretty amazed as to what goes on down there uh, at McAllister and how they support uh, our country's mission to, to keep ourselves safe and be able to project power uh, across the world. It really was uh, pretty amazing. Of course, we had to take a picture in front of the, uh, the MOAB there. Uh, not, a live, not a live MOAB, but uh, definitely uh, when you're right up next to it, you can see the perspective and the size of how big that bomb is right there. On uh, November 19th, we had the uh, Advanced Mobility Advisory Council meeting. This is our initial meeting. Uh, this was some legislation that was passed in 2020 uh, that directed the Secretary of Transportation to stand up this council to talk about all things uh, transportation and mobility from both ground and air, uh, specifically on the autonomous and the new technology side of mobility. And so we had our initial meeting November 19th. Uh, I and the agency are a member of that uh, council and, and thank the Secretary of Transportation, Tim Gatz, for uh, appointing uh, me to that. Uh, I share uh, the council with uh, James Grimsley and Jamie Jacob, who I think most of you all know are the, the two uh, main heads of UAS and drones in the state. If, if those two gentlemen can't answer your question on UAS, it can't be answered. Uh, followed up with uh, Amy Walton of OCAST, Jeff Camp of ACES, uh, Jim Roth, uh, Steve Findlay, Gary Ambrose, and Tyler Moore. Uh, those are the nine members of, of the council, and I think we're looking forward to having a good slate of activities in 2022 and being able to move forward UAS, uh, AAM, and making sure that our state is well positioned to try and attract these businesses to Oklahoma and making sure that that's going to be a economic stale st stalwart of, of what our aviation aerospace industry can be. And then lastly, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Sandra Shelton because she was the one that attended this event. I had a conflicting event, so uh, Sandra, you might tell them a little about what you experienced at the L3 meeting. Good morning, Commissioners. You would have been really proud of me at the L3 Harris Aeromet ribbon cutting because the plane was in the hangar and I said, oh my goodness, that is an ag sprayer <laughs> that is outfitted with these giant guns. And it was true, it is an aero tractor that they've outfitted with giant guns. And it was amazing, and I was really proud to be there representing the Aeronautics Commission. Although I was not the smartest person in the room, I was the most overjoyed and entertained to be there. So Governor Stitt was there, and a woman came up to me, and she said that she had just um, sent one of her employees to Women in Aviation Day. So I was so happy about that. So we were happy to attend. And that concludes my report. And by the way, it's on, right on the airport, and uh, I think we should all go take a tour. It was an incredible day uh, at L3 Harris. So I'm happy to yield to any questions about that or anything else. That's at Tulsa International. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Sandra. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Do, do you say that or do I? The next item. <laughs> I just don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> okay, uh, the Aero Caucus, uh, uh, Senator Pugh had tried several times for us to do some EAA discovery flights for lawmakers, and then COVID hit and we didn't ha get the chance to do that. So on October 7th, Shalon Stanley with the Guthrie Airport and Commissioner Putnam helped us, and we flew 25 lawmakers. We had 25 pilots there. Director Artis gave some ground school. Uh, Congressman Russell was there, and he also gave some ground school instruction. So you see, and the lawmakers that came, I was so happy with the diversity in the group. It wasn't, uh, you know, Senator Rosino and Senator Pugh and, and some of our fans, but uh, we had great diversity, and I had a lot of women there. Teresa Camp, the Boeing engineer, flew that day. Uh, and uh, Jeff Sandusky brought a Cirrus, and uh, I fell in love with an RV. Do you know what that is? I know you do. <laughs> you know, with the bubble top. Okay. Anyway, it was great, uh, and uh, we had a really good time, and I think that we plan to do another one in the spring. So I'm happy to yield for any questions on that. Is there any feedback since last uh, day about Yes, so, so Senator Pugh did send out thank you letters to all of the pilots that helped that day, 
and we got them out a little bit late, but they were just in time for Thanksgiving, so that was perfect. And uh, Gary Manning, and, and I just, I do want to say this, the EAA chapters, every time I call them, every time I text them, they are always there for the Aeronautics Commission, and we cannot express our gratitude to the chapters that have helped us. And uh, Commissioner Putnam, can you help me with the chapter numbers? I know chapter 24, 24 is at Sundance. Uh, 1098 and 1612. And 1612. Gary Manning, and he, is, he always answers my phone calls, which is just nice. <laughs> you know, he's just a great guy, and uh, I'm just super thrilled to be friends with them and look forward to joining all the chapters now that I have my student pilot's license. Cool. I will say that we had uh, one uh, state senator fly a second time. He enjoyed it so much. Yes, yeah, Senator so, Pugh flew twice. And another one as well. Oh, Yek. Yeah, Yek yeah, went twice, too. Yeah. I, I think Senator Yek may be looking at flight lessons. Really? Well, we, so we got to him that day. That's good. Yeah. All yeah. right. Okay. And I think Representative Tammy Townley is also taking flight lessons at Guthrie. I think I flew her. She uh, was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next item, uh, seven, Oklahoma Women in Aviation. Oklahoma Women in Aviation and Aerospace Day was held um, in November at AAR on November 5th. And um, we're gonna play just a, a brief video for you. Although the, the long video is two, two and a half hours, we, we have cut it down to three minutes for you. I want to welcome you to this wondrous event that we're celebrating women in aviation and aerospace. This is reality in Oklahoma, women in aviation and aerospace, this is what it's all about. And it doesn't take me long to recognize the contributions that aviation and aerospace make to our state. Oklahoma certainly uh, would not be a pioneer in aerospace without the contributions of women. Each year, our state recognizes Oklahoma Women in Aviation and Aerospace Day on December 9th. It's the birthday of Pearl Carter Scott. Scott paved the way for women in aviation. Her first solo flight in September 1929 made her the youngest pilot in the United States. That is truly incredible and so unique to the state of Oklahoma. I want all and the young pilots to start flying. You youngsters go out and get a flight lesson, please, for me. It might change your whole life. So the, the entire group was probably about 650. I, I, we had tickets for 622 and we were oversold by about 20, um, and uh, I wanted, I just want to take just a moment to say, this was our fifth year to do this. Sorry. Five years ago when we decided to do this, we never knew that it was gonna be so important, and I am so grateful to the commission for your support. We raised $80,000, 650 people attended, 76 million impressions were made, in social media and on the internet. 36 million impressions were of Jerry Hunter coming out of that plane with Wally Funk. And had he not flown her that day, I'm not sure that we would have had her there. Just everyone's help was so imperative and I cannot thank you enough. I can't thank the director enough for his support for my um, sometimes crazy ideas. And it, it really matters. And I want to thank you so much for that support. And um, 350,000 people read just the Daily Oklahoma article alone. And I have to tell you that this year we partnered with a company called Jones PR. And although I am really good at communications, Jones PR took us to another level. And the Aeronautics Commission, this tiny 10-man commission, got the recognition that they deserve for creating this law that's the first of its kind in the entire United States. And I am so proud of that. And I hope I've conveyed that to you. Uh, uh, and if you have any questions, I am happy to yield. You did a great job. It was a yeah. great event. We yeah. know you put a lot of, the whole team put a lot of effort in it. It was 
there was an entire board. team and everyone that I called, not many said no to me. And to our community partners and the people working in the aviation industry, I just cannot thank them enough. I look forward to seeing what Tulsa is going to look like in 2022. And, uh, we had 150 students. Paula Keaty was essential to that mission and bringing young people to that event. And I can't tell you how many young ladies came up and said, I mean, you, you see this picture? That's Jerry Barrientos' daughter that came all the way from Tulsa. Jerry lives on Airman Acres, which is a private airport that's a grass strip. But the Aeronautics Commission is touching lives far beyond the 108 airports that we serve. Sandra, so, you've been the spark from the beginning. <laughs> shows it's just it's been awesome so we thank you thank you you said not many said no can you name them specifically <laughs> <laughs> we'll fix it I don't think she'd let them say no. <laughs> I'm teasing Very few, I'm yeah. teasing this is not the aviation mafia <laughs> <laughs> again thank you commissioners I'm so happy to um, be a part of it and I look forward to watching the program grow thank you for all you do with that thank you've you. really made a difference thank sure. you Okay. Next up is financial report, Mr. Wadsworth. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Starting out with the financial summary document, as of November 30th, the Commission had an ending cash balance of $8.8 .8 million, with encumbrances totaling $6.9 million. Estimated statutory revenues for the remainder of this fiscal year are $2.4 million, and outstanding reimbursements owed to the agency total just over $1.4 million. The amount of remaining uh, possible expenditures for the airport construction program total just over $3.1 million, assuming those grants are approved. That leaves us with an expected available cash balance after encumbrances and expected income of $2.6 million for the end of this fiscal year. And then our total fiscal year to date expenditures as of the end of November totaled $1.7 million. Moving on, on to the revenue document. Um, total statutory revenue collected for the month of October, $629,392. November was $803,855. Total statutory revenue collected through November of this fiscal year was $2.4 million, which compares to $1.4 million, same time frame last year. Uh, specifically, aircraft excise tax, since that is our largest revenue source. Uh, last year, it was $894,000 at this point. This year, we are just over $2 million. So, certainly a good trend, and we hope that continues into 2022. And then finally, on the three-year average chart there, you'll see that revenue from uh, registration fees, excise tax, fuel tax, and specialty license plates is up about 468,000 compared to what our three-year average is. So again, all the, all the charts and graphs ever we display them all look positive at this point. So happy to answer your question. Claim credit for that then, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, certainly uh, better than where we were at uh, and have emerged post-COVID really strong so happy to answer any questions questions thank you very much item nine airport strategic planning meetings director Grayson thank you mr. chairman and uh, if you'll uh, indulge me for just a second that uh, on the previous item where we were talking about women aviation day I think we all can appreciate that uh, it is a team effort but but really it's it's all because of this lady right here um, I wasn't. Uh, I was here, yes, uh, but it was Vic Bird who gave her the the permission that said, "Yeah, if you want Women in Aviation Day in statute, you go do it. You use your political capital to make it happen." And and we kind of let Sandra go, make it happen. And and we did think it was going to be a neat thing and it was going to be a cool thing. But uh, I think anybody would be lying to you if they said back then that they believe what it would be what it is today. Um, and it really has become probably the commission's signature event um, that we're known for. And so this is the Sandra Shelton event. We'll have to uh, figure out a way maybe to rename it at some point in time. But uh, it really is, it, it truly is amazing. It's a team effort. I want to thank, you know, the ODOT staff, uh, the OTA staff, uh, the volunteers from across the state that, that do what they do, and, and particularly uh, the, the members that come and speak. Uh, we have a big lineup, whether it's the Gov, whether it's Wally Funk, whether it's senators, representatives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a big event, but at the center of all that, if you look at the diagram, the, the crazy string diagram that you'll see sometimes in the, uh, the corner of someone's room, the center of that string, all those strings point to that lady right there. So, um, and I, I know everybody appreciates that, but let's just, uh, 
Let's give Sandridge a little round of applause for that. <laughs> On to our uh, airport strategic planning meetings. Uh, we have been out and about and visiting our, our airport friends uh, even during the holiday season. Uh, and I, I do apologize for, for Nick Young not being able to be here. He did not want to uh, share his uh, rough sinus infection that he has had right now. And, and I spoke to him this morning and he does sound pretty rough. So uh, he decided to stay home and I'll be able to take over most of his items and, and the rest of the items will be able to uh, defer to January if I'm not able to talk about them. But uh, the, the airports team, we've been to several airports as you can see there on the list uh, for various reasons. Uh, Durant and Max Westheimer Airport, uh, Nick Young went to, to talk about kind of a kickoff meeting for their actual dedicated planning studies, whether that was a master plan uh, or a specialty planning study. Uh, Durant happened on October 15th and then Max Westar happened on October 26th. Uh, and we, we want to make sure that, that airports that are in growth modes, that are in expansion modes, that are on the up and up uh, and have some vertical trajectories, know what their plans are going to be for the future. Because we've seen time and time again in the 70s and the 80s, the 90s, even the early 2000s, where decisions were made to place hangars, or taxi lanes or fueling systems that felt right at the time, like that was the best spot, the easiest way to go about doing it, but really locked the airport into some, some bad developmental policies. Uh, and so they may have put a hangar right there that blocked a fresh 15 acres from being able to be developed. And so that's what these, these planning efforts that, that some of these airports are undergoing uh, really are looking to do, is to get that plan down on paper to transcend any individual person, whether that's a city manager, a mayor, an aeronautics director, an airport manager, an FAA official, uh, anybody. We want to make sure that this plan transcends all those single individuals to make sure that the airport is serving the needs of aviation, the community, the state, and our country. And so both of those occurred uh, in Durant and Westheimer, and, and KSA is, is conducting those planning efforts and, and really is pretty pretty amazing to see what Durant is doing in their expansion since they've gotten their 6,800 foot runway. And, and obviously we know Max West Armour Airport is a, is a growing and, and burgeoning airport. And uh, they got a little little limelight a week, week or so ago when a, a certain coach showed up to town uh, via the airport and uh, made the news. So I talked to the airport manager. He uh, said that's probably the most amount of people we've ever had at the airport at any one given time. <laughs> fun, fun times uh, in aviation aerospace. Uh, had uh, our annual meeting with the Oklahoma City Airport Trust November 15th, talked to them about CIP. As we know, uh, they have three airports that they oversee. Will Rogers, the, the big one, Wiley Post, the big GA reliever, and then obviously CE Page out in uh, Yukon uh, in El Reno. And uh, got several projects coming up, talked about what we're going to be doing. We've really spent the better part of the last decade of improving Wiley Post, bringing up the electrical system to standards, making sure that the pavement is in good shape. They were just recently announced for some, excuse me, supplemental discretionary funds from FAA for uh, the widening of their west runway at Wiley Post and really excited to see how that's going to, to help the airport grow and project forward. So I had a good discussion there. Also, uh, this is our first time to, to visit with the new director uh, of the airport. We obviously have visited with that director in his previous capacity of the Tulsa Airport, but Jeff Mulder who was recently appointed as the new director there uh, for the Oklahoma City Airport Trust, had some good conversations. And I've already had multiple conversations since then about development, activities of the airport, what direction we want to go for all three airports. And, and I have to say I'm very pleased. So good to, good to see that the city made a good selection there. Uh, followed that on with a, a trip to Mid-America Industrial Airport on November 22nd. Uh, Mid-America, uh, they've had a little staff turnover there. Uh, their longtime general manager after many, many years uh, had retired, and so we wanted to come introduce ourselves to the new GM and new uh, overseer of the airport and make sure that everybody knows uh, what's needed for the facility. We invited some of the tenants there uh, that have a great interest in the airport, wanted to make sure they were aware of what we were trying to do. And uh, there's a little car manufacturer announcement that happened uh, earlier this year that we're gonna bring several thousand jobs to that facility, and, and that gentleman brings an airplane to the facility, and. We want to make sure that that airport can accommodate that particular airplane, given how important that company is to the industrial air, to the industrial park uh, in general, and how important all the companies are to the industrial park. Ponca City, uh, one of our uh, favorite airports, specifically for their Mexican food. Uh, although we didn't get to do that on this particular trip, this was a late afternoon meeting. Unfortunately, we got to sync that time a little better next time around. 
Uh, went and visited with Ponca City about their future development, particularly the terminal building that uh, we've got in our airport construction program to reconstruct that terminal building and then put some apron out in front of the terminal building. And so we visited with the city manager, the mayor, who I think most of you all know is a pilot, those that went to the Ponca City runway celebration earlier this year. Um, great opportunity to meet with them and kind of discuss what's going to be happening at that airport, particularly how do we develop the terminal area and the terminal building uh, to support not only aviation traffic, but obviously their big uh, restaurant traffic as well. Uh, I know a couple of staff members went down to Medill and I joined via uh, web uh, at the Medill airport to discuss their runway plans. They're in a somewhat similar situation to Bristow. I think everybody here knows about Bristow and how rough that runway was, how it didn't meet standards, how it really couldn't be extended where it currently was. And, and Medill's in a very similar shape. Uh, they have a runway that can't be really extended where it's currently at. Uh, doesn't necessarily meet standards, uh, doesn't allow for a lot of growth and room for expansion. And so I uh, wanted to get down there and talk to them about their feasibility study that they had wrapped up uh, to see about what could we do for this new runway that is in the airport construction program, although at the end of the ACP, that, that five-year time period. And then lastly, we met with Duncan uh, on November 30th and discussed with them their specific planning effort, which is going to be kicking off uh, here very soon and uh, met with uh, their engineers, their city manager, uh, some of their staff, and some of their council to kind of discuss the same thing that we discussed at Mid-America, at Durant, Max Westheimer. What is the future vision of the airport? Where do we need to focus our energy, attention, resources, and, and where do we need to be able to put those taxi lanes, those hangars, to allow for growth and development uh, without impeding future capabilities for the airport? And so that's it's been a busy uh, couple months visiting our airports, and I know uh, some of the rest of the staff has got some, some great things they want to report out to you, and so in the interest of time, I'll stop there and stand for any questions or, or comments that you all might have. Sounds like you've been busy. Refresh my memory. Where is in Mid-America? Mid-America is in Pryor. Pryor. That's uh, north, east, northeast of Tulsa by probably about 30 or 40 minutes. Thank you. Any other questions? Next item, 10, legislative congressional update. Legislative and congressional update. Um, the uh, state congressional redistricting, uh, obviously that has occurred. We've had some redistricting maps. Um, I think the only commissioner that was actually impacted is uh, Commissioner Potter's district. I think he's now in district five, uh, one. Yep, so, uh, no, two. He was in district one, now he's in two, right? I think I think that's right. He he was in uh, uh, Congressman Hearn's district, and now he's moved to Congressman Mullen's district. And so I think that's the only commissioner that's been impacted uh, from an address standpoint. Uh, obviously, our state uh, districts, state senator districts, state representative districts have had little change, and some airports are getting new senators and representatives. Some airports uh, are staying the same. And so as we get through that process and update our sheets. If there's any substantial changes, we'll definitely report on those to you. Uh, we know you have relationships with some of these legislators, and, and obviously if someone's losing an airport or gaining an airport, we want to put an asterisk on that and highlight that. So, um, Sandra, anything you want to add to that particular item? Uh, just that he's been able to make it okay. back to his office. Yeah. Okay. The 2022 legislative session update. Um, We've obviously got at the top of our list removing the cap, as you saw from Chris's financial report. Uh, we may exceed the cap this year. Uh, if things are going on the same trajectory that we've experienced uh, for the last five months of this fiscal year, then it's definitely possible that we could get close to and or exceed. So that's obviously first priority on our list is, is making sure we can lift and or raise that particular cap. Uh, also want to make sure that uh, we're able to continue the appropriation success that we received last year, actually just uh, gave a presentation to the Senate <clears throat> General Government Transportation uh, Budget Subcommittee yesterday and, and had some good conversations with them as to how we're using the existing money they gave us and, and what we're looking to do moving forward with uh, additional money that we might be able to get in the future from, from the state appropriations process. Uh, <clears throat> commercial air service incentives, uh, that's a big one. Uh, you'll see an item uh, here later in the agenda to, to discuss that, but that's something that I know is near and dear to the hearts of our commercial airports. Uh, was talked about in the uh, 2020 session a lot. Uh, didn't talk really about it in the 2021 session because we were still in the midst of COVID recovery. Uh, but I think it's gonna be brought up and, and I think we need to be 
uh, leading that charge given our knowledge, expertise on, on air transportation and uh, opportunities there. And so we want to make sure that commercial air service incentives can be offered to some of these airports uh, for enhancing new direct routes, uh, new service, new startup service uh, at particular airports. Um, other states are doing this. Other communities are doing this. And this isn't to really completely subsidize a route. So we can't just make a route up out of thin air. But this is, think about the last mile. This is just to get us over the hump to try and compete with all those other particular communities and airports that are looking for a route. And so if you only have one or two airplanes as an airline to try and choose five or six different communities that want new direct routes, we want to make sure that Oklahoma is standing up and saying, hey, we are putting our best foot forward, and, and here's some incentive to try and close that gap. And really what this is is risk avoidance. Anytime you start a new route, airlines having to take a risk. And so what we're trying to do is trying to take that risk out of that so that the airline feels more comfortable about trying to start that new route. And last but not least, we have requested a few uh, unmanned aircraft system shell bills. Uh, there may be some tweaks to the advanced mobility uh, pilot program that we would like to do. Uh, I was talking with James Grimsley about that uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, nothing substantial, nothing substantive on UAS like we had last session that designated OAC as the clearinghouse for UAS activities in the state. Uh, maybe just a few tweaks here and there. Uh, but things are coming along. Sandra's got some good bill requests out there. She's made plenty of contacts with senators and representatives. And that would be it for the 2022 legislative session update. Uh, and lastly, uh, item C is the congressional update. Um, we uh, probably have heard, uh, if we haven't been, or if we have been paying attention to the news, we probably heard about the BIF or the Bipartisan Infrastructure uh, Framework that was passed, uh, $25 billion coming to airport infrastructure over five years, so $5 billion a year. Uh, that's divvied up into a couple of different pots of money. Uh, One billion of that is going to terminal buildings, and this is per year, so it's broken up per year. One billion a year going to terminals, one billion a year going to FAA, air traffic control tower type infrastructure, and then the other three billion a year is going to be uh, broken down um, into just kind of general AIP allotments divvied up between commercial service, cargo, and, and general aviation. General aviation is going to get about $500 million a year divvied up based on the categories and classifications of each airport. Uh, and then obviously the air traffic control and terminal building programs are going to be more competitive in nature. And so we are gearing up to make sure that Oklahoma is going to have our hand held out to try and get some of that additional money to make sure that we can improve upon our airports and how much additional money each general aviation airport or each commercial airport in the state's going to get in terms of formula type money. We don't know yet. Hopefully we'll know more on that in January, February, and we'll definitely report at our January commission meeting or our March commission meeting, whichever uh, happens to be the first one after we receive that information. But exciting times in the world of aviation and airports. Infrastructure money is flowing, and we hope to be able to take some, some of that money and bring it to Oklahoma and proudly put it at our public airport system. That is it for the legislative congressional regulatory update, but I will uh, stand for any questions. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Two. Two now. Thank you. All right, item 11, Aviation Aerospace Education Update. Paula. Mr. Chairman, if you would indulge me for just a minute, I believe we have uh, Mustang Superintendent Bradley here. Uh, thank you for coming to the meeting and uh, thank you for all the work you do with Senator Racino to try and promote aviation aerospace for the, the Mustang area and, and getting kids excited about aviation <laughs> aerospace careers. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, first of all, I'd like to let you know that AOPA window, application window, has opened. So if you know of schools um, that are interested in receiving the free AOPA high school curriculum, then obviously I'd like to know about that because I have, even though the window did not open till November 16th, I've done lots of background work this fall uh, visiting with school superintendents across the state to make sure that they know this tremendous opportunity. The window closes on May 31st, but that's a little bit deceiving because most schools will pre-enroll for uh, the next school year in March, early April at the latest. And so, you know, a school is not going to say, well, I believe we'll offer aviation if they didn't give that pre-enrollment opportunity to students. So the window is relatively small. 
very excited though as we move forward. Uh, secondly, you'll see that um, we had some really exciting news. As Director mentioned, and, and I won't steal his thunder, but we've had a lot of good exciting news this month. One of these, and this one in particular, uh, thrilled me. We received an email and a call from the AOPA saying that Oklahoma had been selected as the first state outside of Frederick, Maryland, the headquarters of AOPA, to host uh, the professional development for teachers. So all of our schools, our new schools that we're recruiting to teach aviation, will be able to send their teachers. We have not set the place yet, probably in Norman or Oklahoma City area, so that those statewide teachers can easily make it to Norman or Oklahoma City for the three-day, four-day professional development. We will offer year one professional development, year two, year three, and year four, allowing all of our teachers without having to go to Frederick, although it was always a fun opportunity, it's much more cost effective. And I was delighted, I think it speaks volumes, that the AOPA uh, selected Oklahoma as, as the state that they would launch the regional training, so I was very pleased. Uh, the third item, C, the AOPA always hosts a National High School STEM Symposium. In fact, in 2016 when I attended in Seattle, Washington, that's what set me down this particular runway, so to speak. Uh, it changed my life drastically. That, that STEM Symposium for teachers is critical. Sadly, it was to be in Orlando this year, and because of their high COVID numbers in Florida, they chose to make that a virtual event. I think nearly all of our schools uh, had some representatives attend virtually, so, so that was good. Obviously, it's not as, ever as strong as it is in person, but next year's event is slated for um, Memphis, so we're excited about that. Um, D, many of you have heard that uh, Norman Public Schools announcement this week that they will be developing uh, an aviation high school and the future on the campus of Westheimer Airport, an actual building where students will attend high school there, and we're very pleased about that. Norman administrative team uh, visited Ada City Schools earlier in the month, uh, and, and Mike Andrew, I always want to hats off to Superintendent Anderson and Ada and his staff who opens the door over and over and over to these schools who are interested. What does this look like? How do we start a lab? you know, how can we build a program? And they're always uh, willing. Norman visited and I think went back with some, with some strong ideas about how they could put together uh, a program. Um, next, uh, Eddie Compton of Oklahoma Career Tech and I joined Senator Jessica Garvin at the Mid-America Technology Center in Wayne. Uh, Director Artie's joined virtually to talk about the new Choose Aerospace Maintenance uh, curriculum. And that right now is being field tested across the nation and will be rolled out in August to schools choosing to choose this uh, new curriculum. It's for juniors and seniors as opposed to AOPA, which is 9, 10, 11, and 12. But will lead them in to certification programs for A&P. So again, uh, uh, Career Tech and Wayne was taking the initial steps to, to look at that. Uh, Sandra and I met with Senator Zach Taylor in Seminole to discuss his interest in working to develop legislation that would help to ensure that students receive some type of core credit rather than elective credit for AOPA coursework. We're working on that right now and, and are working to set up a meeting with Superintendent Hoffmeister to really look at that in detail uh, to see how can we make that work for students because students don't have enough elective hours and we don't want to kick them out of the pathway. We want them to be able to go up, up that pathway. Uh, on November 18th, Commissioner Rainey um, and I met with Matt Rank and his wife to discuss homeschool uh, consortiums using the AOPA curriculum. I res visited with AOPA and they said that if a, a, a cooperative, a homeschool cooperative can come up with five students to enroll in aviation, then that curriculum would be made, made available to them. So I'm working with Mr. Rank and his wife to perhaps get on the agenda at their uh, yearly meeting to be able to talk to them about rolling out the curriculum to homeschool cooperatives. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been very busy uh, trying to be boots on the ground, visit with these school superintendents. You have to do it in person. You can't call a superintendent and say, why don't you start an aviation program? I mean, you know, that isn't going to fly, so to speak. I, I, you, know, you really have to do some 
lay some background with them. But once you get in the door and are able to see, let them see what these programs mean for their kids, uh, it's been an extraordinary mission for me. And uh, in the, just in the last few weeks, we've garnered some very key schools that I think are important. Uh, Bartlesville has signed up, Lawton High School, Enid High School, Norman High School, Norman North High School, others such as Pawhuska, uh, Chisholm, uh, lots of schools across Oklahoma. So this window opened for AOPA and they are starting to apply and I will know more as to how many. Um, right in August of this year, we had 31 high schools. It's my goal to have 50 by the end of uh, some grant impl implementation that director will speak to you about in, in a few minutes. But we're working to at least get 50 high schools that are teaching aviation. That's remarkable to go from one in 2017 to 50 in 2021 or 22. So we're thrilled about that. And then finally, our next uh, Aero Education Summit, and you may not be aware, but we've held two or three summits in quadrants of the state, brought superintendents in to let them hear what we're trying to do. Um, and our next one is set for January 14th in Weatherford at the Stafford Air and Space Museum so that we can bring in some of the western and central western uh, schools and, and try to get them on board. I'll be delighted to stand for any questions or any comments that you might have. Uh, one comment, I think uh, when uh, the Norman High School uh, decided to go to the airport, it was on the local television station, yes. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Marvelous. Yeah. Yes, we've had gotten lots of good press lately in Southern Oklahoma. Uh, several announcements have been on the news in K-10 and uh, some of the TV stations in, in southern Oklahoma as well. So, Paula, we're deeply grateful for all you've been doing. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> this is the good news. Yeah. This is this is the fun stuff. Not that yeah. <laughs> not, Paul's been having a lot of fun. I know that traveling across uh, the state, and it's it, this topic is just near and dear to my heart because this is how I got into aviation. You know, I was I was that kid that was shooting rockets and crashing planes on simulators and went to every camp I could go to as a kid. In fact, I, uh, every once in a while I have a memory come back and I go, ah, oh, I, I wish I could go do that again. I wish I could go shoot off a rocket. I used to build so many model rockets. And maybe I can, maybe I can come. Yes, what's, stopping yeah. what's stopping me? <laughs> well, you know, we did build one at the Women in Aviation Day event. In fact, I think I saw Commissioner uh, Hunter, your I picture, you, uh, you shot that one off yet? No. No? Okay. Uh, we actually have our rocket sitting in the office. We had it uh, autographed. Wally Funk. So yeah, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna shoot that one off. That's that's for sure. Uh, anyway, to the uh, the item at hand, uh, number twelve, FAA Workforce Development Grant. I think everybody here knows we had applied under the FAA Workforce Development Grant. Senator Inhofe's office was uh, extremely instrumental in putting these two programs into the 2018 FAA reauthorization package. One for aircraft pilots, drone pilots, and engineers and the other for the more maintenance and skilled labor side of uh, the workforce pipeline. Um, we teamed up with uh, several entities from across the state, kind of created a statewide consortium. Uh, we led the organization on the pilots, the engineers, and the drone pilots. Uh, Career Tech led the other application for the skilled labor and maintenance side. And I'm um, happy to report and uh, excited to announce that we have been awarded the FAA Workforce Development Grant for the Pilot Engineers and Drone Pilots Program uh, awarded $491,000. Uh, we had asked for 491 and 323, so they just they took the change off and said, "Here you go." Um, and it's that's exciting. Uh, that's it's it's one. It's a recognition of the agency. I think two. It's a recognition of the state and the partnership that we were able to put together. Uh, it was a team effort. This wasn't just a a single individual, although. The, uh, the brainchild, just like Sandra was the brainchild behind the Women in Aviation Day, the brainchild behind this particular program, this particular effort, standing here to my left and your right, uh, Ms. Paula Keedy, and, and really her passion and her energy is what drives this. And the fact that she's able to consider herself a, a now aerospace professional after having been involved for five, six, seven years, it truly is amazing because I've been in this since I was a kid, and the fact that she's just now been able to pick this up and is doing what she's able to do is, is truly amazing. And it's, it's really something that we can all be proud of as an agency uh, and as a state. And, and I want to turn it over to Paula and let her kind of talk about what we're planning to do with the grant money and, and some of the things that we're trying to, to stand up. But this, 
this really is aviation aerospace education. Th this is where the rubber meets the road in trying to craft that next generation of workforce professionals for aviation aerospace and getting our young people interested in all forms and facets of aviation aerospace careers. So, Paul, I'll let you uh, talk about the, uh, the details. Thank you, Director. We are so excited, so thrilled uh, with this. We began writing the grant in March and took about a month uh, to put it together. I had tremendous help from April Millaway uh, Williams at the Center for Excellence at OU uh, who helped add all the graphics and the glossy and the, the things that need to go in the application. But I do want to just briefly touch on the bulk of the narratives. Uh, one of the things, and actually this was Director's idea as we were driving somewhere, I can't even remember, but he said let's take some of these older AOPA schools and let's designate them as a, uh, aviation high schools of excellence in quadrants of the state. And so uh, we are going to do that. And uh, Mr. Bradley is here from Mustang. Mustang Public Schools will be one of those because next year they'll go into year four uh, of aviation for the AOPA, and that's the capstone course. If you are the Aviation High School of Excellence, you will kind of serve as the mothership for those early, younger AOPA programs in the area. Provide programs for teachers, provide STEM days for students, in the grant also a considerable amount to be able to touch high school counselors and superintendents. How do high school counselors lead Commissioner Rainey in while he's at school? How do, how do they lead them to these programs at OU and OSU and Spartan and Southeastern? How do, we, how do kids know? They don't know and then the counselors don't know. They can't lead them that way. So a lot of that is grassroots for schools, for us to be able to guide those school leaders uh, to help students. We're going to have several different quadrant luncheons for school leaders where they actually are going to do hands-on uh, activities, lab activities, and get their hands dirty and learn about aviation and aerospace. So I think uh, what it means to me is that it gives us some funding, it gives us some leverage to move forward in a really strong way. You know, with only one person in 50 schools that would be teaching a AOPA high school curriculum, to be able to have some schools of excellence that can add their expertise uh, as they move forward with implementation will be critical. So we were, we're thrilled uh, with this announcement. When you send a grant off, you have no idea, and you just kind of cross your fingers and hope. I felt like we had a good, a good, uh, product, but you don't know until you get that phone call. So we were very, very excited. I'd be glad to stand for any questions. Paula, when when are they saying the money actually is transferred? I believe the program will start in January, and it's an 18th month 18 month implementation. So that means boots on the ground. We will really be putting this into play. Uh, I've already started the work, even though we've not had the initial meeting yet to hear truly what the expectations are, so. Sounds like a big job. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank Congratulations, you. that's wonderful. Okay. Item 13, Commercial Air Service Study. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I uh, alluded to in the, uh, the legislative report, uh, one of the big initiatives that uh, we're going to be looking to accomplish in 2022 is the Commercial Air Service Incentives Program. Um, one of the things that uh, the Senate and the House and, and all of the uh, airports have kind of made an ask for is let's, let's do a preliminary, very basic, bare-bones study as to what kind of, how do, how do we stand at the framework of such a program in a state? And, and then also, what, what routes should we go after? What, what's going to be the ROI? of those routes, uh, if we put in a, a million dollars of state money into a subsidy to go after a direct route, what's the return to the state on that $1 million in that direct route and what they're able to bring to the state beyond just the direct economic benefits? We know there are companies out there that say, we will not relocate to Oklahoma unless you have a direct flight to X, Y, and Z. And so uh, I've been talking to uh, our friends at the Department of Commerce, uh, Brent Kissling and, and Jeff Camp with ACES, uh, and this has been something we've discussed here for the better part of the last three or four months, and I think now is the time, since we are moving forward with this as part of our 2022 legislative package, 
to, to move forward into the RFP, RFQ phase and select a consultant and partnering with the Department of Commerce to help pay for a study. Uh, expect it to be probably about fifty or sixty thousand dollars at the end of the day, but what we have before you is just a request to move forward to go through the RFP process, select that consultant, and then we'll be back to you with a contract approval. So staff recommends approval and I'll stand for any questions. $60,000 would be our funds, Commerce's funds, shared funds? Shared, split. Okay. The, that's the 50 theories. 50-50. 50 50. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Ready for questions or comments? Ready for a motion? Yeah. I move approval. Second. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Chairman Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Item 14, Airport Construction Grant Program. Then. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner. Uh, for grant construction program, we have two projects with amendment this time. Uh, first project is at Ardmore and uh, for this uh, project, we had the constructing taxiway Alpha and constructing taxiway Echo and installing medium intensity uh, taxiway lights and LED guidance sign. Uh, the amendment uh, for this project would allow for uh, line item adjustment due to li liquidity damage and funding will be moved uh, from construction to engineering or inspection to offset uh, cost uh, due to the increase uh, in, uh, in time on the project. However, the amendment will not increase the uh, commission's previously approved share. Uh, the total cost for this project was uh, over $4.2 million. Uh, FAA has uh, spent about $3.8 million, and the uh, state and the sponsor has uh, spent over 211000 for this project. Uh, next project uh, is at South Grand Lake. Uh, for this project, we have a rehabilitation for the and widening the runway 1836 and also installing the medium intensity uh, runway lights and PAPI. Uh, the amendment for this project will allow for line item adjustment due to liquidity damage again. Uh, funding will be moved from construction to engineering uh, sponsor losses and uh, uh, permit extension uh, to offset cost due to increase in time uh, on the project. However, again, the amendment will not increase the commission previously approved share. The total cost for this project was about $4.6 million. FAA has spent over $4.1 million, and uh, the state and the sponsor, each one of them, has spent about over uh, $229,000. I'm standing for any questions you may have. Questions? Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Appreciate it. Out of 15, five year airport construction program, Mr. Young, who is not here today. <laughs> I'll do my best, Mr. Young, impression on his behalf. Uh, Five-year airport construction program, uh, as we've alluded to in, in past meetings and standing up our airport hangar grant and loan program, uh, we sent out a request to all the airports uh, in our system uh, asking those that are interested in partaking in the program. We received about 24 different responses, uh, so our, our response was pretty high, especially considering this was a, a program that was kind of thrown upon them at the last minute. Um, and we, we made the request in, in probably July or August made a, about a 30 or 45 day deadline to respond and, and wanted construction to start fairly quickly. And so the fact that we had 24 airport sponsors say that you know we would like to partake was, was good. We were glad to see that, glad to see a lot of excitement, excitable sponsors to take advantage of, of what we know is a very important infrastructure need and hangar development across our state. Uh, before you today uh, is a consideration to amend the airport construction program to add in these seven hangar projects uh, as what we believe are the seven best ones of those 24. Uh, there in front of you on the agenda and on the screen, you will see the uh, sponsor's preference for loan or grant, uh, the commission's share of, of what the project would be, and then also the uh, approximate hangar that the sponsor is looking to build. Um, we have Ardmore Municipal Airport uh, wants a loan, uh, $600,000, of course that's our cap. If we remember, we capped ourselves on loans at $600,000, we capped ourselves on grants at $300,000. We all kind of base this off of about a million dollar hangar and we're doing 60% for loans, 30% for grants. 
and uh, Ardmore wants to build a big hangar, uh, 70,000 square foot. So this is about a 15 or $20 million facility. So we're just financing a little piece of that, but uh, important because they have a tenant that's going to be uh, brought in there. And I believe we have uh, a representative here from the, from the airport, Ms. Mita Bates. Do you want to come forward and say anything or? Thank you, Director Artis. No, uh, Ardmore is very excited because uh, we have done some tremendous things at the Ardmore Municipal Airport, and we are currently in negotiations with a company to relocate an MRO facility to Ardmore, and one of their immediate needs, of course, is a hangar, and so this would just allow us a little jump start in getting that hangar. We're in a very, very aggressive time frame. They would like to be operational, in about 18 months. And so as you know, that's a pretty aggressive time frame. But it's a very exciting project. It's not been made public, so I can't offer a lot more about that, but we really appreciate your assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Mita. She's uh, been a great supporter of the commission and she's been very good for Ardmore and all the things that have been going on down there, aviation aerospace, and obviously a great supporter of the Ardmore Municipal Air Park and what they're trying to do to make that a, a global transportation uh, and infrastructure center down there. Uh, next up is, is Grove. Uh, they would like to go for a grant, $300,000 at the cap, 100 by 100 box hanger is the proposition. This would be next to that terminal building that we built and opened up, I believe that would have been 2016 or 17. So great, great development there on the west side of the airport for those of you that have been to, to Grove. Uh, Okima uh, Municipal Airport, uh, they, uh, I think we all know about the story of Okima, relocated airport several, several years ago, actually relocated airport now, but probably a decade ago, uh, how time flies. And that airport, great airport, we spent some NPE money there to build them a brand new 3,000 foot runway. Uh, they've got a nice apron, but they don't have any based aircraft. They don't have any hangars. So what we're looking here is to help them get to that magic number of 10 based aircraft so they can then get that NPE money flowing again. And so that's the whole reason why we're selecting Okima is to help help them as well as help us get some of the federal money, regular federal money flowing to that airport. Uh, they're looking to do a 60 by 60 box hanger as well as an eight unit T hanger, uh, $300,000 in grant is what they're looking for. Uh, they're at Paul's Valley. Uh, again, they would like to go grant a $300,000 cap, uh, 100 by 100 box hanger. Uh, they are one that just like uh, you heard from Ardmore, is, is ready to go. Uh, they've got the designs already done uh, and, and would like to, to move forward with this. So it's probably one that's going to be getting a uh, bid sooner rather than later. Uh, Stan Stanford Municipal Airport in Southeast Oklahoma and Hugo, uh, they would like a grant for four 42 by 30 box hangers. Uh, the reason for the specificity and the size is that's the existing size of the box hangers that they have out there. So they'd like to continue that same size. Uh, they are not requesting the full amount. They're requesting about $45,000. That's what uh, they estimate the, the cost in terms of the 30% cost as to uh, what that would be. Uh, Stroud Municipal Airport uh, is requesting a grant for a nine unit T hanger. Stroud's in a similar position to, to Okima. Stroud does have uh, about nine aircraft. They kind of teeter on that 10, nine, eight based aircraft. And so they, they've been unclassified they've been classified and, and we're just helping to make sure that, that Stroud remains classified and can remain uh, having that federal money flow through it on a routine basis. And so hopefully this will put them over that 10 based aircraft hump for permanent status and we don't have to worry about them being classified or unclassified and, and where's that funding going to come from. And also Stroud's got a lot of activity with Mint Turbines as you heard from, from Sandra earlier. Mint Turbines, great company there based at, at Stroud, Oklahoma. And then they've indicated uh, a desire to potentially use some of these hangars to, to store some airplanes if they're going to try and bring them in for PT-6 overhaul repair. And then last but not least is Thomas Municipal Airport in Northwest Oklahoma. Uh, they would like a loan, $600,000. Uh, they're building a 100 by 100 hangar as well as three 50 by 50 box hangars. Um, obviously, uh, we're getting to seven. I think that's probably the max amount. We've got about a little over $2 million of, of projects here. Uh, this is adding these projects to the airport construction program. Uh, once that occurs, we will then work with the sponsors to do designs, go out, get bids, and come back to you for approvals of the grants or the loans as we traditionally do at the commission. Uh, if we're able to get additional appropriations from the legislature and we start making this a routine thing, 
we'll just include this as part of our normal airport construction program package that we do at March and May. But given this was a, a new program, legislature gave us the appropriation after the last approval of the ACP. That's why we're here today uh, asking for this approval to add these projects into the ACP. Uh, staff does recommend approval, and I will stand for any questions or comments from the commission. I know we've had hangar shortages all over the place for a very long time, so this is a step in the right direction. Questions or comments? Entertain a motion for approval. I have a question for you, Mr. Sure. Please, sir, Mr. Chair. Is the, uh, the two million appropriated last additional appropriation of last year, was that just a one time or uh, it wasn't added into the base? Was there any conversation from the legislature about adding it to the base? Um, uh, that is the hope. And that, that part of that discussion was uh, our budget request yesterday, the presentation we made to the Senate uh, GG&T budget uh, subcommittee, is that we would like to start making this as part of our traditional operating request. Um, and so I think that was a, you know, kind of a special one-time deal, but I think given the, the strength, given the information we provided to the legislature, we'd like to make that a part of our, our routine and, and increase those appropriations as possible given the, the state's budget picture and the um, better budget time that we're in today. And so that's, that's the goal. I think we've made a request for $3 million for, for next session. And mm -hmm. of course, given your connections, we'll probably be leaning <laughs> on you a little bit to uh, help, help uh, talk uh, to some of your friends. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Any other concerns, questions, comments? All right, we're ready for a motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. All roll, please. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Commissioner Ortega. Aye. Commissioner Ritz. Aye. Commissioner Rainey. Aye. Chairman Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Thank you. I, uh, I've made one little false step here. I didn't uh, see Miss Jane Hughes come in. Jane, if you want to approach the bench and say anything. Jane is the uh, city manager from Okima, and so I, uh, I saw Mita here in the front row, but I didn't see you, Jane. Sorry about that. Well, I was a tad late. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Bryson. Absolutely. You know how much this means to us. Okima is a very small town, and we have fallen into the um, whole concept of growing our aeronautics. We hope to be in the school program someday. But at this point in time, we are very gracious to you guys for giving us this opportunity to build the hangars, and they will come. Um, we are working also on another grant to kind of compile and so that we are able to do both the box hanger and the tea hanger. So obviously, we're going to be working for a long time. And I was um, also requested to extend an invitation to all of you to the Okima the Turkey Hunt. Grayson has attended that. It's a lot of fun. We'd love to have each and every one of you. It's, it's a great time. You learn a lot about, I'm not sure what. What did you learn? <laughs> um, maybe I, not for public consumption. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we, we learned how to hunt turkeys. Uh, <laughs> this is that, uh, what Jane was mentioning was Lieutenant Governor's turkey hunt that happens every spring. It's uh, economic development opportunity uh, to get everybody together and try and showcase the various communities across our great state. And so it's a, it's a great event the Lieutenant Governor puts on and uh, I had the opportunity to go to Okima this spring and, and yeah, if you have the opportunity to go take advantage of that, I, I highly recommend it at any of the locations across our state, whether it's Okima, further southeast in Oklahoma, northwest, northeast, southwest, uh, great event. And if you like turkeys, they're even better. Okay. Raver item 16, airport construction update. Thank you, sir. Uh, this year we had 25 construction projects uh, all around the great state of Oklahoma. And the first project we are going to talk about is at Alba, that we installed an omnidirectional approach lighting system hodl at runway 18N. Uh, the total cost for this project was over $262,000, and the state fund was about $250,000. At Atoka, uh, we cracked seal and seal coat the runway and also we installed LED runway lights and LED pappies. The total cost for this project was over 233,000 and the state uh, spent over 221,000 for this project. At Chattanooga, uh, we had cracked seal and seal coat for runway, connector taxiway, and apron pavement uh, and also we installed uh, LED runway lights. The total cost was about 
$500,000 and the state has, has spent over $472,000 for this project. At uh, Okin, uh, the project was to crack seal and seal coat the runway, taxiway, and apron, and also we installed LED runway lights. Uh, the total cost for this project was over $360,000, and the state has spent over $25,000. Uh, at Cleveland, uh, one of our unclassified airports, uh, we crack sealed and seal coat the uh, the airport, the pavement, and also we removed some obstruction. Uh, the total cost for this project was about 255000 and there is no uh, state fund for this project. At Cordell, uh, the project was to crack seal and seal coat the runway and also installing uh, two box PAPI. Uh, the total cost was over $363,000, and the state fund was over 28000 At El Reno, uh, we rehabbed the apron area around the existing fuel system with six inch of concrete. Uh, the total cost for this project was over uh, 306,000 and the state has funded over 235,000. At Gage, another unclassified airport, uh, we cracked seal and seal code runway 1735 and the total cost for this project was over 333,000 with no state fund. At Hilton, uh, another unclassified airport, uh, we cracked seal and seal code the runway and taxiway and apron area. The total cost was about $203,000 uh, $203, $203, uh, with no state fund. Uh, the next uh, project was at uh, Harmony, unclassified airport. Uh, the total cost was over 327000 The project was to crack seal and seal code the runway, taxiway, and apron and also we removed the obstruction and no state fund. At Lawton, uh, we construct a new terminal building. As you see in the picture, we have a new uh, car rental center and also baggage claim area. And if you know what's going on in the back of the state, state you see that uh, in the right uh, picture uh, for the baggage claim. The total cost for this project was over $4.3 million and the estate uh, funded over 436000 uh, for this project. At Lindsay, uh, we rehabilitate the runway pavement and also the taxiway light. The total cost was about $300,000 with no state fund. At Max Westheimer, uh, we mill and overlay the parallel taxiway for runway 1836 and runway 321. Uh, the total cost was about $5.7 million and the state has funded about $280,000. At Mayama, uh, we rehabilitate the runway and taxiway pavement. The total cost was uh, about $676,000 and the state has funded $213,000. At Cheyenne, uh, another unclassified airport, uh, crack seal and seal coat the runway and taxiway and also we installed uh, runway and taxiway LED lights. Uh, the total cost was over $335,000 with no state fund. At Mid-America, prior, uh, we extended the parallel taxiway for 1,600 feet and also rehabilitated the existing taxiway and taxiway lighting. The total cost was about $2.1 million and the state has funded over 466000 At Okima, uh, unclassified airport, uh, crack seal and seal code the runway and taxiway. And as you see in the left pictures, uh, we had the replacement for panels at apron area, uh, the total cost for this project was over $325,000 with no state fund. At Ponca City, uh, we reconstruct the runway 1735 and also improve the uh, drainage for runway 1735. <coughs> As you see in the picture, I was there several times during the construction. Also, you see the final product and also we had the chance to have a um, ribbon cutting ceremony. And I believe in that picture, you can see Secretary Gatz and also uh, Commissioner Rainey. Uh, the total cost for this project was uh, about $8.1 million. No state fund, but uh, there was a CARES Act for about uh, over $800,000 for this project. At Poto, uh, Robert is here. I've installed an ODIL at runway 18 end. The total cost was over $172,000, and the state has spent uh, about $164,000. At Seminole, uh, the project was to install LED runway lights and also real. Uh, the total cost was about $428,000, and the state has spent over $406,000. At the Skytook, uh, 
reconstruct runway 1735 and the connecting taxiway and also installed LED uh, runway lights. Again, as you see in the picture, uh, for the ribbon cutting day, we had uh, Governor Stitt, Secretary Gatz, Commission Rainey, and of course, Director Ardiz. Uh, the total cost for this project was about $2.2 million, no state fund for this project either. At Tahlequah, uh, the project was to install LED taxiway lights and guidance signs. Uh, the total cost for this project was over $685,000, and the state has spent $264,000 for this project. At Telqua, uh, another unclassified airport, uh, we removed some, uh, some obstruction and also we installed a new rotating beacon and new lighted uh, wind cone. The total cost for this project was over 277000 with no state fund. At uh, Tishomingo, uh, another unclassified airport. Next slide, I guess. Um, the the crack seal and seal code the runway and also remove the obstruction. The total cost for, for this project was over uh, 323000 with no state fund. At last but not least, at Weinoka, uh, we had runway overlay for 1.5 one one, one inch. The total cost for this project was over 405000 and the state fund was over 68000 I'd like to mention that overall for all these 25 Airport, we have spent $3.5 million from the state fund, and overall, it was more than $30 million uh, overall. I'm standing for any question. I'm impressed by the before and afters on the seal coats. Those really look good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're doing some good. I'm really proud of us to do that. Comments, questions? Looks good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 17. Good morning. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Are you excited about pavements? <laughs> Probably not. You know, pavements really, let's face it, they just kind of lay there. And uh, unless there's a uh, pothole or a, a bump or a detour that you have to go around, people don't give much thought for pavements. But we should be excited about pavements because it is the largest capital investment we have at our airports. And uh, pavement monitoring and maintenance is required by the FAA's grant assurances. Therefore, we want to extend the pavement life as long as possible in the most cost-effective way as possible. And that's what uh, airport pavement management system is all about. So what is a pavement management system? It's a defined procedure for collecting, analyzing, maintaining, and reporting pavement data. And to do this, we follow the FAA's advisory circular 5387B, which gives us the guidelines to follow uh, in doing uh, the collection. And we also follow uh, the American Standard Testing Materials D5340 to collect that data. We take that data and then we input that into PAVER, which is a software developed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and that gives us a pavement condition index. Okay, what's a pavement condition index? A PCI is a numerical rating of uh, pavement condition based on type and severity of distresses observed. And the numbers go from 100, which is good, down to zero, which is failed. So with those numbers, well, with that background, what I really want to talk to you about this morning quickly is uh, the airport pavement management system process, the purpose and value of that, and as well as what we've completed to date. So. How do we do this? Well, we go out to the airports, obviously, and have to have boots on the ground looking at the pavement, uh, determining the pavement distress type, which could be uh, longitudinal transverse cracks. It could be uh, block cracking, alligator cracking, weathering. There's a lot of different uh, criteria that we look for. And then we also evaluate the level of distress, whether it's low, medium, or high. And then we measure that, quantify that uh, for each type and distress uh, severity. Here, here's a map that we take with us when we go to these airports. Airports uh, have about, well, a little over 20 acres of pavement. I'm just talking about the pavement, not the whole airport. There's about 20 acres of pavement at an airport. So it's a, it's a big task to inspect those pavements. And uh, so we take this map and we use this to write the uh, distresses that we find, but we don't look at every square inch of that pavement or it would take a day or two to do that. So what we do and what PAVER allows you to do is if you look at the blue squares there, those are sample units 
and we'd look at those sample units and take those samples and get those uh, quantities in those areas. And it's also broken down by uh, branches, which are the runways, taxiways, aprons, uh, taxi lanes. And then uh, we get that for each one of those, but we only, again, look at the blue areas and then the paver extrapolates that to the whole airport. And we were able to do these in about an hour instead of, like I said, a day or two. And again, uh, we quantify the distress type, the severity, and quantify those, and we put that into the uh, PAVER program. Okay. And then the PAVER program, it comes up with that PCI number. Uh, and this is a map of the output of that, and it gives you the PCI numbers uh, for each section, and it rolls up into PCI for the whole airport. I really like this map that it uh, prints out because um, the numbers don't mean anything to most people. And this is a graphical representation, the dark green being uh, a good, as you can see in that uh, index down below, the lighter green being satisfactory, the yellow being uh, fair, and then I think we had a red one on this one too that is uh, poor. And thank goodness it didn't have any of those other colors because that would mean that things were really bad. But I think this is a lot easier for somebody to look at and see uh, the different areas of the pavement and what condition it's in. So um, the paver also gives us a lot of other information besides just a PCI data. It gives us the current and five-year forecasted PCI by section. It gives us a planning level near-term maintenance by section and a five-year major rehabilitation needs by section and year with planning level estimated costs. So what this does is it gives us advance notice for planning and budgeting and maintenance and rehabilitation. So we have an idea ahead of time of what we need to do. Uh, this chart is one of the outputs from PAVER. It's a little hard to see, but the, it breaks it down by section. That fourth column tells you what the existing PCI number is. Those next five columns actually forecast what the PCI will be for the next five years. And then the last column there is probably, uh, again, like the colors, is probably better the words that tells you that that number means it's poor, fair, satisfactory, or whatever the rating is for that PCI number. Um, we also give this information uh, is available to everybody. If you go into the OAC website, the little green circle at the very top, and uh, go to the OAC website, and at the top menu there, if you click on Airport and APA, a little drop-down menu comes down uh, for pavement management. If you'll click on that, on the next slide, you'll see what comes up a map of Oklahoma with all the airports uh, that we're looking at. And if you click on one of those airports, uh, you can zoom in and see uh, the PCI ratings and a little table comes up and you can actually zoom in on that table again and see additional information. And that's available to anybody through the OAC website. So what's really impor important and the purpose and value of the PCI studies is this uh, graph that shows, can we go back one? this graph that shows the decline of the pavement condition. And if you do repair and maintenance, you saw all those uh, uh, seal coats and uh, crack sealing projects that we did. If you do it early on in the pavement life when it drops down into that satisfactory area, instead of waiting until it gets closer to the fair, if you, what you would spend a dollar for now uh, would cost you about five times as much then. Or if there's suddenly a, a steep decline in the pavement condition as it gets a little bit older, when it gets in that fair condition, it drops off pretty quickly. And it doesn't take long where it's much, much more than uh, five times the cost to repair something. So that first cost would be like for a seal coat or crack seal. If you wait a little bit later, you're talking about doing some patching or maybe a maintenance overlay, which costs about five times more. And if you wait until later, we're talking about reconstruction, which is much, much more than uh, five times. So to preserve that investment in the pavements, we want to do things early on in the pavement life to keep it up there in that good state. Thank you. So another uh, purpose and value is advance notice for planning and budgeting airport maintenance and rehabilitation. Uh, the paver gives us this information at, uh, by a section. It gives us planning level estimates for that. It prioritizes the pavement sections for repairs and it allows us to prior prioritize airports for repairs, which is system-wide planning. 
It also uh, makes available information to the agencies, airports, and public. Uh, the PCI information is available to the FAA, the OAC, airports, and the public, which I just showed you. Um, the PCI database is done every three years, so we monitor and verify the rate of deterioration that way. We document pavement uh, maintenance and repairs that way, and it meets a very important aspect of this is meeting FAA and OAC's grand assurance requirements for each airport. And something that uh, I think is a very valuable aspect of this program, too, is that we go out and see all these airports every three years, and I think it's really important for us to meet with the airport managers and just kind of show them the love that we're there, we're, we care about their airports, and um, that we're inspecting the pavements. We're, we're not the pavement police. We're actually getting data. We're helping them. The letters that we write them and give them this information helps them budget the, uh, for their maintenance and repairs. It's been interesting. Some of the airport managers, they see us come and, and they get a little defensive, wonder what we're doing there. They're nervous about it. But by the time we leave, they understand that we really are there. Uh, we're the government, and we really are there to help. I mean, we give them information and, and help them uh, with the planning and the budgeting for their airport. Um, and finally, uh, what we've done today, we've done 31 of these airports. We've done the inspections and written letters with all this information to these airports. Uh, next year we'll do 30 to 35 more and the year after that we'll do another 30 to 35 and have all of the airports done that we're going to do in, in this system. We're not doing uh, Tulsa International or Oklahoma City and, and a couple of others but anyway every three years we'll make our rounds and do this again. And uh, finally I guess I would like to take a minute and just say uh, how much I appreciate everybody's hard work on this huge endeavor. Uh, we've had interns uh, doing this that kind of bore the heat of the summer out there on those pavements. Uh, Nick Young has gone on several of those. It, Director Artis has been on a couple of these, which I think is important for him to see the effort it takes to do this uh, work. Uh, Thomas and Ben, I think have been on every one, I'm sure have been on every one of them. And I came in in the September and I've done over about half of them with them as well. But I want to uh, particularly commend uh, Ben Nagavi, Mr. Nagavi is, has been really uh, amazing to me how organized he is when we go out to an airport. He has made a phone call. He's got NOTAMs issued. He's, when we show up, all the safety equipment, all the measuring equipment, the maps are, are in place. He's already uh, program managed uh, what we need to do, who's going to do which piece of the airport. And it just I'm uh, impressed with his organizational skills and his project management. And then when we get back in the office, uh, I really have to say, uh, Mr. Nagavi really understands that paver program. It's, it's a complicated program. It's got a lot of moving parts. It's not just putting the data in. It's also getting the data back out in the way that we need it to send these letters to the airports. And uh, I've just been really impressed with Mr. Nagavi, and I just wanted everybody to know that. So I'll stand for any questions. And if I can't answer it, uh, Mr. Nagavi probably can. Are you guys making bores throughout those sections? No, no. Or? It's a visual inspection. Oh, we walk and okay. measure cracks and uh, mounts of different kinds of distresses. Okay. Good. Thank you. Question? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We are excited about that. Right. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, next up, Oklahoma Airport System Plan Update. Mr. Chairman, if you'll uh, indulge me, maybe we can uh, hold this item over till the January meeting when uh, Nick can present on the system plan. Okay, sure. that'd be fine. And uh, that'll kick us into uh, 19, uh, the Oklahoma Military Airspace Compatibility Assessment Mapping Portal Project Update. And yes, that is a mouthful. Uh, OMA Camp, as we uh, call this uh, acronym here is, is about our military airspace in the state. I know we've briefed you on this before, but I, I wanted to give you a little year-end update. And I'm going to let Thomas uh, do some talking here in a bit on, on how he's been working because he has been the project manager and in the weeds on what OMA Camp is doing. Uh, but this is a grant that we received from the Department of Defense uh, to map out all of our state's military airspace in a similar format to what you just saw from the pavement management portal. It's going to be in GIS can use the same software, Esri, uh, Esri software, ArcGIS software. We've been working with our ODOT GIS partners on that particular project. And uh, this is going to be something that's available to the public. Uh, whether you're a landowner, a wind energy developer, a cell phone tower company, 
state agency, federal agency, military base, you name it. And, and this is all kind of culmination of something uh, one, of, one of your brethren, uh, this gentleman right here, worked tirelessly on for three years at the state capitol and making sure our airspace was protected. Uh, one of the things that we heard time and time again when we were trying to run legislation to protect the state's military training airspace was we don't know where all of our airspace is. And so that's what this is going to end the debate on. There will no, there will no longer be this debate of where is the airspace and where uh, should or shouldn't I build and what's going to be more difficult to build in this area versus that area and just early coordination, early communication uh, and, and really helping us out with, with OMA camp. And so uh, we had our first uh, advisory board meeting with OMA camp, uh, Thomas, was it a month or so ago now? And, um, and so had a, it was just a consortium of, of military members, uh, base leaders. We had several state agency leaders throughout Oklahoma, uh, our Department of Commerce, obviously aeronautics, our consultants, wind energy, uh, cell phone, tower companies, so on and so forth. And uh, had, had a good meeting, kind of just to introdu introduce them to the project. And it's, it's been a little different working through COVID. Traditionally, we would have had that opening meeting at the beginning of the project. But of course, we weren't able to do that at the beginning of the project. So a lot of the project was kind of flipped around. We did a lot of data collection early, and now we're kind of reporting out on how that data uh, is going to be finalized. And I hope first half of 2022, we'll be able to roll this project out and, and finalize it and, and tell you more about it. And Thomas, I don't know if you want to come up here and kind of get into the weeds and, and tell them some of the details of, of what you've been doing with, with the Oma Camp project. I can do just a couple little more sure. update things. Uh, the project was originally scheduled to end end of this year. We did get a six-month extension on that, mainly due to the COVID and not being able to meet in person. We are in the process of scheduling our second uh, steering committee meeting. That should be coming up end of January-ish. Um, again, kind of got the cart before the horse on that one, where our project is substantially complete through the tool building and uh, getting that data imported stage, but we still do need to meet and make sure that we're producing something that everybody finds useful. Uh, so those are the two updates I've got at this time. Uh, next item. All right, and then we have an update on the Aircraft Pilot and Passenger Protection Act. Update, this year we took action on 28 permits, 22 were approved, one was denied, three are currently pending, and two were withdrawn. We got those 28 permits out of our random checking of the uh, 7460s that were uh, submitted to FAA. So of 1,803 7460s submitted, 904 were wind turbines, and 899 were other, either towers, power lines, miscellaneous tall things. And I will stand for any questions you've got on that. So we handled 17, 1,800 different requests this one year. That would be 1,800 random checks. The vast majority of those did not require action on our end. Okay. And that's with the FAA forms? Yes. So out, out of that 1,800 number of FAA forms submitted, only about 30 required action from us. Okay. Questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item, Wind Energy Development Act compliance. Defer? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, this will be another deferral if uh, you'll still indulge us. Sure. I hope the next chairman's is understanding. <laughs> <laughs> and 22, review of 2021 Aviation Aerospace Events and Activities. Thank you, Commissioners. 2021 has been a much better year than 2020 was for us, and we're just going to do a little year in review. I would encourage you on our social media, Facebook is an incredible tool. It really uh, documents 
everything that's happening at the agency. When Paula Keedy goes to a school, we document that and we do that. It's a wonderful free resource for us to document these, these events that are happening at our agency. And I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about that social media. So for instance, the Sundance Fly-In, uh, we decided to have that about 10 days ago and I created a Facebook event for the Sundance Fly-In and, and uh, Chris is an administrator for us on our social media as well as myself. And so you can, you can go and review on social media how many impressions you get. And just that event had over 15,000 impressions. If you don't think social media and we're not reaching the public, we are. And uh, you know, ODOT also helps us with that just by them recording these uh, commission meetings. These are on YouTube if you ever wanna go back and watch those. We are, their partnership with us, their audiovisual division is incredible. You know, they did Women in Aviation, they broadcast it. They had 150 people watch the live stream uh, from several states across the United States and also uh, a couple of other countries. And so that social media is really important. So I would encourage you uh, over your Christmas holiday when you're sitting on your couch to go all you have to do is just click photos on our Facebook page and you can go and look across the year and see the incredible work that uh, the Air Knox Commission staff is doing on your behalf. Uh, with that said we had OAOA Capital Day in the springtime and uh, their advocacy helped us get the appropriation from the legislature our first one in a very long time and so we appreciate OAOA. We look forward to Capital Day uh, on March 30th. We call that Arrow, Oklahoma. So please make a note on your schedule. It'll be March 30th, that's a Wednesday. And uh, we're going to be uh, inviting companies to come to the Capitol and we invite our commissioners to be there with us as well. Sky took airport dedication. Uh, ODOT was with us on that. They broadcast that live and of course, uh, it's really meaningful to have that on YouTube. Uh, and so that is also on our YouTube channel. Altus Air Force Base fly-in, we had Commissioner Ortega with us, and that was a specific fly-in, Commissioner Ortega. What, I could not remember the name of it. It's, it's so that, it's so. Uh, I don't remember, I don't remember what it was. It's so GA air aircraft can learn to be, learn to be compatible with the, the flights that are occurring at the Air Force Base. The safe, the safe yeah, yeah, or something. Like yeah. MMAC, no. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Maca. Maca, that's what Maca. it was. Maca, that's right. Maca. That's right. So uh, Commissioner Ortega was there. We really want our commissioners to be with us when we go to these events. We really do. And uh, we're so happy when you do come with us. Uh, this is the Sooner to Space Forum at Rose State College. And you can see there that we have the current director of aeronautics with the former director of aeronautics and the current director of aerospace at Commerce and the former director of aerospace at Commerce with um, former Congressman Jim Bridenstine, Administrator Bridenstine. The TASM Aviator Ball, uh, Commissioner Potter uh, was there with us and there were four astronauts there, Grayson? Four, yes. The Chickas Chickasha Municipal Airport had a fly-in, and I believe Paula Keedy attended that, and somebody else went with you, Paul Thomas. Yes. So we are always out and about. The Ponca City Airport dedication, and uh, was such a great event as well. And that is the uh, Phillips 66 hangar. Old Phillips 66. Yes. Okay. EAA Air Venture at Oshkosh. Uh, we're looking forward to 2022. Tinker in the Primes, uh, there is a new lady in charge that I met at Sunday, nope, where did I meet her? Let me think. Oh, at the Air Force Association uh, holiday dinner, and her name is Marcy, and so we, were, we are going to be working with her on Tinker in the Primes. She's asked the Aeronautics Commission to kind of help her kind of craft her mission there, and uh, so we're excited about that. We're looking forward to that. And there was a house interim study on OSIDA, and the importance uh, and role of the Air Knox Commission is because OSIDA is an airport within our system. So uh, the El Reno Fall Fly-In, Adam Fox does an incredible job, and uh, there was s lots of people there that day, and the Air Knox Commission set up a booth. I think Thomas was with us. And the Westheimer Aviation Breakfast, Ben got his picture made with the governor. So <laughs> his 2021 is checkmark complete. So NBAA, of course, the Oklahoma booth, and 
uh, the Air Force Association Garrity Chapter Chili Cook-Off at Tinker Air Force Base. That was Michelle Bozaiden's first time to ever be on Tinker Air Force Base. And uh, we, were, we were there having our chili, and there was a giant thunderous roar, and they were, Jason, what, what kind of planes are those? AWACS. No, no. bigger. Uh, KC-135s? No. no C-17s. It was a big, loud airplane. It was a B-1. F-35s. That's what it was. Yes, so we were excited to get to see that. Michelle and I were gushing over that. Uh, and then we had the joint EAA chapters holiday fly-in at Sundance this last Saturday. I, I do want to speak to this for just a minute. Uh, we did tell the EAA chapters 10 days ago that we'd like to do this because Nick Coleman Productions was here filming. Uh, and so they put that together. They fed over 170 people. We had 200 people there. 15 students flew. Seven were from Mustang High School. And um, again, that partnership with EAA is so meaningful to us, Commissioner Putnam. And uh, Commissioner Hunter, thank you for opening the doors of Sundance to us, and we appreciate that so much. And Santa was there, and Santa came in on an R-44 helicopter. We'd like to thank uh, Aircraft Specialties out of Tulsa for helping us get Santa to um, Sundance Airport. And this is our joint EA chapters holiday um, party, which I invite myself to every year. <laughs> and I can see, I can invite you next year. <laughs> and that concludes my report. Any, any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. Uh, I've checked my calendar for January, and I do not see the next meeting. Refresh my memory. January 26th. January 26th. 26th January. In this room at 10 o'clock. This room, 10 o'clock. That will be our next meeting then. Okay. Any new business of any matter not known about or which could possibly have been handled in the last 24 hours? Final chance for comments? Then I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Have a great Christmas. Thank you much.